Hi, welcome back. My name is Steve Miller from Williams College. This is Teachers as Scholars, and we are going to be doing our second session today. And we've just finished alphabet codes, and we are moving on now to Vignery and permutation ciphers. So some of the stuff we're about to see are things you've already seen or already mentioned earlier. And they all come down to trying to make the encryption more secure. So the issue is that we are always sending a letter to the same new letter. So maybe E is always encrypted to a Z, B is always encrypted to a Q, and because of this, there's only 26 things somebody needs to figure out. And because each letter is constantly encrypted to the same thing, as was remarked earlier, maybe you can do a fancy analysis. You know, e is the most common letter in English words, T-H-E is the most common three-letter word. If you have spaces, you can use this to try to figure out what some of the letters are. And then as you crack those letters, you fill that in and you try to figure out the other words. And so there are things you can do. So what we want to do is we want the same letter to be sometimes encrypted to Z and maybe sometimes encrypted to a Q and maybe sometimes encrypted to a V. And so one of the ways this can do we can do this is to take a key phrase and so the key phrase here is the very simple key phrase a b c a b c a b c a b c a b c and what we can do is we take our message dad can add a bed and we write a b c a b c a b c below it and then d plus a is e a plus b is c but now d plus c is g so the E and the G both represent Ds. And because they're encrypted to different letters, if you try to do a frequency analysis, you wouldn't be able to. So the question is, how secure is this? What do you think would make this more secure in terms of choosing your passphrase? Adding numbers. I'm sorry? Adding some numbers. Yeah, adding some letters, making the passphrase longer than just three letters. You know, if you do Yankees suck, you know, <laughs> and it would be a while then before things repeat. Now, one of the dangers is that if you choose a passphrase that people can guess, your message might be decipherable. A couple of years ago, when I was giving this lecture, they had just discovered a message from the Civil War from the Confederate to the like central command to the general uh, of Vicksburg, and it was thrown in a river outside the city. Now again, with modern computers, it's very easy to crack. It actually used one of the common key phrases that the Confederates liked to use. So if you actually knew their key phrase, it was trivial to crack. And this is the danger of using something multiple times, because once you crack it, you can then crack anything using that but the computers were still able to crack it without any trouble. And the reason the message was thrown in the river was the messenger arrived on July 4th, right after the Union Army had just taken Vicksburg and the Union flag was flying. And so the messenger realized, well, there's no need to deliver this, tossed it in the river and went away. So if we have longer phrases, it will be a little bit easier to protect and then you have to use more sophisticated uh, methods. So here's a bunch of links on how secure this is, uh, as well as you know, the story I was telling you about. There are ways to try to guess the length of the key phrase. And if you know the length of the key phrase, even if you don't know the key phrase, then you're in great shape. Because really, what is the Vignuri cipher? If your key phrase has length three, it's just Caesar ciphers where you have maybe three different shifts and you go one after the other after the other, and then you repeat. So you just keep cycling among the same three shifts again and again and again. So if I know the length of the key phrase, what I can do is I can do a frequency analysis by breaking my message up into smaller messages. So if the key phrase is of length five and the text is very long, I break it into five messages and look at a frequency analysis for each one. So there are ways to try to attack this. So the more general way of doing these alphabet codes is what's called a permutation cipher. 
So we have 26 choices for A, 25 choices for B, and so on and so on and so on. So the number of possible ciphers we could have is 26 factorial. Because once we choose what A goes to, there are now 25 choices left for B. Once we choose what B goes to, there are 24 choices left for C. So how big is 26 factorial? It's four times 10 to the 26. So you can try to get a, give the students a sense of how big is that. And you can say, imagine you had a computer that could check 10 to the 10 things a second, which is a good amount. And then you could see how many seconds would it take to get up to 10 to the 26. You can talk about what is the life of the universe. So imagine your computer has been running since the dawn of time. Is that enough to have checked all the possibilities? And I believe you'll see that the answer is no. This is a lot more than affine, than just the linear AX plus B. You know, that was on the order of 300. This is on the order of 10 to the 26. So is this secure? You know, could a computer really go through all of these? Mm -hmm. Or perhaps we don't have to check everything. Maybe after we start getting a few of the letters, we could then use that to figure out other words and then use some kind of divine inspiration, good guessing, to try to go through all the 26 factorial possibilities in a better order rather than just naively trying them all. Say, I've got some partial information. This is probably going to be a better choice to try next than that one. Well, as we remarked, we have frequencies of letters. And so what I would do is the very first thing is I would look at what is the most common letter. And if it's in English, it's probably an E. You can also look at bigrams or trigrams, two and three consecutive letters. You know, TH is extremely common. THE is extremely common. And you could try guessing that, well, whatever the most common three letter thing is, I'm going to guess that that's THE. And if you do stuff like this, it turns out it's not that bad to crack these. The level of security is very weak. Uh, what I sometimes tell my students is, your parents are able to solve these daily cryptograms. And some, you know, with the respect they have for their parents' mathematical skills, that's often enough to convince them that this isn't that powerful. You know, mom and dad can do this. So we have a problem. These alphabet codes are very easy to use. Right? To use these alphabet codes, all we have to do is decide how do we want to shift each letter. Unfortunately, they can be cracked, so we need a more powerful method. And so we're going to get to RSA, which for many of years is the gold standard of encryption. And so what I want to do is I want to try to motivate why we use primes for encryption. Why do we do this switch? So I'm going to give you two different systems. In the first system, I choose two prime numbers, P and Q. And I'm going to make them 200 digit prime numbers. And I'm going to multiply them together. And their product is going to be publicly displayed. So P times Q I'm going to display, but I'm going to keep P and Q secret. And the password is either P or Q. So there are two different passwords. You give me either one and you are in. And there are 200 digits. So how many 200 digit numbers are there? So about how many 200 digit numbers are there? 10 to the 200. 10 to the 200. <laughs> Okay, to give you a sense of just how big is 10 to the 200, there's on the order of 10 to the 80 or 10 to the 90 objects in the universe. So imagine every object in the universe was a universe. That gets you to maybe 10 to the 170. Imagine all of these are supercomputers doing 10 to the 10 operations per second for you. That's around 10 to the 180. And they're running since the dawn of time. I don't think that's going to quite get you to 10 to the 200. So a universe of universes of supercomputers working with you since the dawn of time is not enough to try all the different passwords. 
that should give you some sense of this is pretty secure. Here's the second system. I'm going to just choose a 5,000 digit random number and the password is X. You know, screw this choosing two primes and multiplying them and making that product public. Screw having two different passwords. I'm going to just choose a 5,000 random digit number. There's 10 to the 5,000 possible. That's going to be much harder to guess. So which do you think is the more secure system? The primes or the 5,000 random digit number? The primes because they go on forever? Okay, so the primes do go on forever, but so do numbers. And I can just keep choosing larger and larger numbers. Oh, okay. 5,000 is more than 10 to the 200. Right. And you're given information with the prime. I'm telling you that the password divides this number n. Ah. So doesn't it seem like the 5,000 digit number should be more secure? Yes. Yes. However, given that I am a mathematician who does number theory and studies primes, and I'm talking about why primes, probably the first one is better. My students would definitely not get this reference, but you might. Uh, have you seen Monty Python and the Holy Grail? Mm -hmm. so do you remember the bridge keeper? And he's asking people questions and you have to answer the questions right to pass. Mm -hmm. In the first system, we do not need an intelligent gatekeeper. Does the gatekeeper need to know the password? No. All the gatekeeper needs to know how to do is divide. So you tell me, I think this is the password. I'm going to check and see, does it divide n with a remainder of zero? If yes, you're in. If not, you don't pass. Mm -hmm. So in the first case, the gatekeeper does not need to know the password. What about the second case? It's a 5,000 digit random number. Does the computer, does the gatekeeper need to know the password to know if you're right? Yes. Yes. How does the computer tell if you're right? It checks and sees, does your answer match what's in its memory? So this gives you the possibility of torturing the computer or the gatekeeper because they know it. So for a lot of things, when they generate security like this, they use the first method, they create the primes on one computer and then they destroy the computer. And now there's no trace of how those were discovered. So the phrase is, I'll know it when I hear it versus you have to know. And then this is the calculation I was telling you. So it comes up to about 10 to the 192. So a universe of universes of supercomputers would probably not be enough to crack this by just trying everything by brute force analysis, running since the dawn of time. Okay, so the last thing I want to do uh, for this session uh, before we break is just quickly describe RSA. This is the gold standard or was the gold standard for years of encryption. And I want to just get a sense from you as to how you want to use the rest of the day. What do you want to hear about? This is the more mathematical part. I want you to be at least aware of what's going on. And I can give you more details as to how we prove things. Part of it is devoted to some mathematics that can be pulled separately. And you can show your students there are things you've been doing all of your life that you can do faster. And right now, for those of us who are stuck home with slow broadband, uh, we are seeing that any ways to transmit information faster is better. And so I think we talked for the first time about some error detecting, error correcting codes, and being able to transmit things efficiently. So here's how RSA works. So it is required whenever you give the lecture that Alice is always sending a message to Bob. The only freedom you have is you can have either Charlie or Eve be the eavesdropper who's trying to intercept the message. So Bob does the following, and I could put subscripts of B on everything so that we know that it's Bob who's doing this, but for simplicity, I'm not. So Bob chooses two secret primes that are large. In the interest of space, I'm going to just choose a five digit prime. I should really choose a 200 digit prime. So Bob chooses P and Q and he chooses some number D. He makes public the product of the two primes 
and a special number e. And these numbers are chosen so that e times d equals one mod p minus one q minus one. So what this means is consider a clock with p minus one q minus one hours. Then the number e d is just one plus a multiple of p minus one q minus one. Just like 13 and 25 are the same as one, that's what we're saying here, is that e d minus one is a multiple So there's a couple of questions you can be asking. How does Bob find these primes? How does Bob find this E and the D? We'll talk about that later if you're interested. The way it works is you have some message and your message is just some number that's less than N. And you take that message and you raise it to the eth power and you send the remainder of that when you divide by N. So if you want, Think of E as a 200 digit prime. That means we are doing 10 to the 200 multiplications. And you might be wondering, how can we do 10 to the 200 multiplications? There's a way to do it fast. It's amazing. And it's something that you can do with elementary school kids. And so when we do that, we get the message 12120973. And Alice sends that message to Bob. And then Bob takes the message he receives and he raises it to the dth power. And he looks at the remainder when he divides by n. And if you go through the algebra, you end up getting the original message. And what's nice here is the whole message is gobbled together. There's no way of trying to attack, well, this is probably what E was encrypted to. And I'm going to use that to now try to guess that maybe this is the word the. None of that is going on here. The whole message is convolved together. And it's based on the assumption that there is no good way to factor numbers. We don't have a fast way. Can somebody give me a way, if I tell you n is p times q, can somebody give me a way to find the factors of n? I don't care if it, it's fast. I just want a way that will find the factors of n. How would you find what numbers divide n? So what would be the first thing you, you might try to see, does this divide n? Try two. Try right, two. And if it works, great. Now you know two is a fact, and now you look at n over two. If two doesn't work, or even if it does, what do you try next? Three. Three. What do you try after three? Five. So if you're clever, you try five. If you're just being naive, you would try four because four is the next number. And so, so on and so on and so on. We could just try every number up to n minus one. So in some sense, factoring is trivial, right? It's not hard to factor a number. You just keep checking things and see what works. Now, if you want to factor efficiently before the universe dies of a heat death, that's a completely different story. And if we just tried one, two, three, four, all the way up to n minus one, it would take so long that it would not be practical. Okay, maybe we don't have to try all the way up to n minus one. How large could the largest prime factor of n be? So imagine n is of size 10, I'm sorry? Would it be m? Like well, uh, any number, it could uh, be any so, number, as long as you're willing to go to decimal. Let's say n is composite. Okay. Let's say n is of size 10 to the, let, let's say n is huge. Could I have a number as large as n over four as a factor? Sure, you know, four times n over four or two times two times n over four would work. Mm -hmm. But I can think about 
if I write n as a product of two numbers, let's say I write n as x times y, is it possible that both x and y are large? Well, if x and y are both very, very large, then their product will be larger than n. Mm -hmm. So typically we would say, let's let n equal x times y. And actually, let me, yeah. um, let me just change what I'm sharing. So let's say n equals x times y. Can both x and y be as large as, say, n to the two-thirds power? Could x and y both be very, very big? How large would x times y be? Infinite? Well, if x is greater than n to the two thirds and y is greater than n to the two thirds, how big must x times y be? At least how big? n to the four thirds. Excellent. It has to be at least n to the four thirds. And so if it's that large, then x times y can't equal n. It would be too big. So what we can get from this is if x is less than equal to y, x is less than equal to the square root of n. Because if x is greater than the square root of n, and y is greater than the, uh, the square root of n, their product is greater than n. So this tells you that if a number is composite, you can find a prime factor by going up only to the square root of n. You don't have to try all the numbers up to n. That's a tremendous savings. So once we check all the way up to the square root of n, we're done. And so um, I will now try to go to turn on the video. So I was showing this earlier, you know, here are the numbers from one to a hundred. What are the primes that are at most the square root of 100? So what primes are at most the square root of 100? 1, 2, 3, 5, 7. Right, except seven. one is not a prime, one is a unit. So it's just 2, 3, 5, 7. So 2, 3, 5, 7 are the only primes that are less than or equal to the square root of 100. So I first, I put down all the twos. These are all the numbers that are multiples of two. Then I throw down all the multiples of three and I cross those out. Then I throw down all the multiples of five and I cross those out. And I think the next one is the sevens is all the multiples of seven. And I don't need to do anything else. All the numbers that are left are the numbers up to 100 that are prime. And so I now know a number like 89 and 97, these numbers are prime because if they were composite, they would have to be divisible by a prime less than their square root, less than equal to their square root. And so I can get all the way up to 100 by just checking multiples of two, three, five, seven. So there are some tricks we can do to save things. But unfortunately, in general, it's still going to be 
uh, challenging to figure out um, some of these implementations, to figure out these factorizations. So again, we have to be very careful what do we mean by difficult. It is not hard to multiply and divide numbers, but it is time consuming. So I will just end with the implementation issues. As I mentioned, how do we find the large primes? How large is large enough for good security? How do we find the numbers E and D so that we can get E times D is one on a clock with P minus one, Q minus one hours? How can we raise a number to the 10 to the 200th power? You know, we can't do 10 to the 200 things. Right now our students are having trouble doing one or two things. To do 10 to the 200 is beyond reasonable. And the last, is this secure? Is there a way that E can determine D from E and M? Because remember, the way that we decrypted was we raised the message to the deep power. We have to assume Eve has received the message. If she can figure out D from the public information from the N and the D, I'm sorry, the N and the E, then she can read the message. So we hope that she can't do that. We saw with the Caesar cipher earlier that trying to make it more secure by doing it 17 times in a row doesn't actually help. Right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop things here uh, and then I will resume the Zoom meeting in about one minute and we can talk about what we want to do next.